Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast. This week, we talk about the Anglo-Saxon arrival. So last week, we presented you with the recordings of our sources, or our primary sources, for the original Anglo-Saxon invasion. Gildas, Bede, and Nennius uh, present versions of the landings and versions of the historical story that if we're to be blunt, have problems and holes in them and create examples of why history is so hard to follow in this age. The three actors in this play have presented us with stories that don't actually completely match up. Where they do match up, it's very minimal. And when they don't match up, it's a whole lot of stuff that don't have a lot to do with anything. In the case of Gildas, he's talking almost well, probably likely about a hundred years after the fact, maybe even longer, depending on the situation, which means he's even fairly far from the original story, thus not necessarily well informed. Bede, as we've mentioned before, takes a look at it from the Saxon point of view. He's he's definitely not a lover of the British people nor of their opinions. Um, and Ennius, of course, is looking at it from the complete opposite side of that. And in both his case and Bede's case, they intermix mythological stories and legends in with the probably legitimate story that Gildas gets us closer to. But even he is mixed up with a lot of religious overtones because he's not teaching history, he's sermonizing. Both Bede and Gildas are trying to tell a story which has a religious segment to it. Thus, they are not going to be historians the way we think of. And Gildas specifically is is not to be considered historical. And we've talked a little bit about this. But within his narrative, there's a lot of information which goes back to the Roman times and Roman Britain and how things were settled. So this is going to be another one of those discussions where we're going to talk about things from a standpoint of what we think we know versus what we knew and where we are and whether we can take for granted the stories we've been told in the past. So let's start with the stories we've been told in the past. In the past, we've been told that the Saxons landed on the Isle of Thanet with three ships led by Hor Hengist and Horsa, the main founders of the Anglo-Saxon race, if you want to call it that. Uh, they then landed, decided, made an agreement with the local British groups. And then at some point during this process, ended up arguing with the local British uh, people over demands of food and supplies, and in the end decided that they'd had enough of listening to the British and became rebellious and decided to set up their own communities and in the end forced the communities of the British people either into slavery, destruction, or to flee. And until finally a group came out of the mountains and took them on and fought them tooth and nail for about a 50 year period, which then finally leads to a British victory that apparently for at least a few years offered peace between the two peoples. That's the story as it's told by the three sources we have within them. There are variations, there's additions, there's subtractions. There's talk of Vortigern who doesn't exist in Gildas, but exists in the later stories talk of Arthur, which comes in at the at the late date of the 800s with the uh, Ninius storyline. By this point, of course, legend has now overtaken a lot of fact, and we know that most of what we're reading at this point is piled up with bias, with political reasoning, and and as well as a conflict which has gone on very much in that century, as opposed to talking about it from the century prior to, you know, the centuries past. These are not narratives that are to be taken as legitimate beyond what we can understand and, and absorb within them. So what can we say? Well, we can say that historians, archaeologists, and many others have looked at this, both trying to prove and disprove and arguing back and forward amongst themselves much. This story is much like the Celts. You don't have a straightforward narrative. Things are very difficult to identify. It is in part because there isn't a lot of written history. 
there is at least some, which makes help. It's a lot more helpful than what we had prior to the Roman invasions. But at the same time, the idea that there's a specific type of people and how they came about and what they did when they got here and the narrative that went forward after the fact differs quite considerably from what probably has happened. So we're going to try and break some of this down. And even in the last 10 years, I will say that there's been a switch back and forth between one idea and the other. So originally the concept was at least going into early historical periods of the 17, 1800s is that the Anglo-Saxons landed here, started to fight the British because the British were not strong enough to deal with the Germanic tribes. They would conquer and they would control this island pretty much for the rest of the next 500 years. This group, uh, the Saxons were made up of three tribes, the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes, purportedly coming from the northern Germany near Denmark is generally the historical idea of where they've come from. This is based on the evidence that is given to us in the historical sources. As archaeology starts to pitch in in the 1900s and into this century, there's been changes in the way we've looked at and evaluated how this happened, when it happened, and going forward, what it means. Because history, written as it is, is always changeable, is always malleable, and our understanding of it changes and, and is malleable over time. The concept of how people are buried changes from day to day. You know, it, there were times when we thought, well, this is a definitely a such and such burial. This is definitely another kind of burial. And then some facts start to get in the way. For example, we can't easily identify gender sometimes. A lot of times the way they used to identify gender is how you were buried and what you were buried with. So in other words, if you were buried with like knitting needles and sewing equipment, if you were buried with swords, if you were buried with shields, that would obviously identify your gender, huh? But not necessarily so obviously because gender was much more fluid in ancient times than it is now. And the understanding of what a woman and a man is and who's the, you know, the one that is defined by what ideal is very different. So thus we can have warrior women. We can have men who, who sewed and stayed home, who raised children. Even in that period of time, the fluid idea of what gender identity is means that you can't just look in the ground and say, oh yeah, that's definitely what that is. So then they start to identify by skeletons, but even that becomes ropey at times because sometimes the skeletons of a man can look like a woman because a skeleton doesn't show you their gender. Or at least it can be difficult to identify a male skeleton from a female skeleton because there's not always a straightforward identification. We think we understand, and most of the time I think we're accurate, but not always. And of course, if things are buried with them, that leads archaeologists to tend to believe what's buried with them defines who they are, and that doesn't necessarily follow either. So with all that in mind, let's keep that in mind as we go forward, because we're going to run into this problem quite often with the Saxons. The Saxons arrive in some manner into the eastern part of England. The traditional ideas about how they got there, I think, have been stretched a little bit because we've come to realize that it, we, in some ways there's been a misreading of Gildas because of the translation of Bede. So many times that I, when I went to my history classes and we talked to Bede, there was a lot of respect for Bede, and there's a lot of historical opinion that, that Gildas is not to be accepted, that he's not legitimate. He's more of a, 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 a religious idealist than he is a historian. And in some cases, religious studies people would find him of more value than, say, historians do. But yet, at the same time, within what he's writing is history. And he's not talking about it based on just what he knows, but also from what he views currently. And so you get a good idea of what's going on in the politics of the 6th century from his viewpoint. Are they slanted? Are they jaded? Yes, of course, we've talked about this. But we can't just ignore him. So, And in fact, Bede is informed by him. So you can't just throw him aside just because Bede seems more legitimate. So what Gildas talks about is he talks about the Saxons being brought over in an agreement. 
The agreement is signed between them and the British people, whoever those people were, we don't know. Were they legitimately elected people? Were they some of the leftover functionaries of the Roman Empire? Were they somebody else entirely? We just don't know. But they are brought over. Now, one contention is, is that they were brought over, and to be fair, Gildas gives this uh, reason, is that they're brought over specifically to deal with the invasions of the Irish and the uh, the Picts to the Roman Britain, and they are put up as federate, federate being the old form of agreement of the latter Roman Empire in which uh, non-Roman tribes are brought in to act as militia, or hired guns, effectively, to take care of problems. And this has a fine tradition that went on in the previous century, and some would argue goes back even farther than that. And typically what would happen is, is they would offer them a, a treaty or organized on the idea that there would be some benefit, be it cash, be it uh, food, uh, lodgings, land, whatever they needed to do to agree. What we know from Gildas is that there was an agreement put in place by the leadership of the two groups. The Federate Saxons were to be subservient to the Romans. And the archaeology kind of bears this out. A lot of the original Saxon settlements are very poor. They're very Spartan. We know this because where they're settled in Roman towns, they don't even really use the Roman facilities properly. In fact, it becomes known as they build their own versions, which are kind of a combination of timber and mud, and they're called a, a grub hut is one of the descriptions, a gruben house. And these buildings are very rudimentary. The methodology of the Saxons in this area is very, very different from what we think of as great gigantic military heads. They seem much more like farmers and peasants and they're cultivating land rather than aggressive invaders. So that begs the question, what happened? Well, unfortunately, again, there's a lot of this. I do, we don't know. But what we do know is, is that in the history of the sources, and certainly going forward in the belief system of many that will come after, these people were brought over to help defend. Now, we do know, for example, that there were Germanic tribes brought over prior to the end of the Roman Empire in Britain, and they were actually settled in certain areas to deal as sort of the troops of the area. We talked previously about the Belgic tribes that were brought in into Saguntium and other places, who then worked with the local communities as sort of the police force, the military help, all of that kind of thing. And so this tradition exists within those groups. Likely, that's kind of what they were going for with the Saxons. Now, here comes the next part of the problem. The terminology Saxon in Roman times and, and late antiquity doesn't mean what we think it means now. Now we evaluate it as being this northern German area that we just described near, near Denmark. Back then, it kind of referred to any sort of non or, or a barbarian tribe. So anybody could be a Saxon, which leads to part of the problem. It's probably part of the problem with the terminology Celt, in that if you aren't one of us, you're just some nebulous name. So a lot of times, a lot of people are called Saxons. That's the reason why Angles, Saxons, Jutes are all identified, and Fris Frisians are all identified as Saxon, even though they're not. So one of our scholars, uh, Charles Edwards, has put forth the idea that what it could be is that this group that's brought in are actually Angles who are settling in, settling in East Anglia and that they are brought in to deal with the Saxons. So instead of fighting the Picts and the Irish, they're actually brought in to fight other Saxon elements who are raiding and invading. And we do know that there is raids and invasions going on by the Saxons, even going far back as the mid-4th century. So we have this past habit of hiring tribes. We have a recognized mislabeling of tribes, which went on. Like Goths used to be a name for a bunch of different tribes, even though that's not really their name. Um, we have this combination of calling things one thing. Then we have this small issue of how did these guys get here and when did the war start? When did the fighting really start? So Charles Edwards put forward the idea that we have a landing of the Saxons 
not in the 5th century initially, but rather going back more towards the 4th century, that there is cultural evidence found in the soil in Britain, especially in East Anglia, of Saxon settlements. However, or Germanic settlements, let's be more correct. However, the reality of it is this doesn't necessarily mean that this culture took hold strongly. In fact, the contention is, is typically is that either this culture migrated within to the Roman Empire, became Romanized, and thus disappeared as far as the record goes, or two, went back home. Because, of course, that's the other thing. Once your service time was up, you could go back to your, to your local people and you would take your money, your rewards, and your skills and use them with your own community. The Goths were well known for having done this. They were brought in as military people for the Romans, but what ended up happening often was that they would become used in a role as centurions, as leadership in the military, of course governed by Roman people, but eventually what would then end up happening is they would then take their time. Once their time is up, they would either merge within the local community or they would go back home take all of that knowledge and Romanize themselves in a way. They would set up military formations and military ideas based off the same goals and achievements that the Romans had offered them, and as well set up their own coinage, set up their own uh, cultural statements, which are very similar to the Romans. Not really dissimilar from what happened in Britain before the Romans got there, where they started to, especially in the East, mint coinage, have very Romanesque style of life's lives, and this kind of continued to occur. The Saxon community, similar situation. There is this movement of Germans into Britain. They are culturally not significant enough to influence the overall culture of Britain. They then either dissipate back into the British cultural milieu, or they are sent back home. However, that all changes at the end of the Roman influence in Britain. At the beginning of the 5th century, we have an arrival of more Saxons. The second boatload of Saxons is probably more likely to be the source of our Hengist and Horsa story, or the legendary founding of Saxon England. This group is found in the DNA evidence that we have, and this is where some of the arguments have been over the last few years is over DNA, because DNA evidence initially, especially at the early 2000s, put into question whether there was actually any sort of invasion or military movement of any Saxon people into Britain. Later on, that sort of became muddled, and now a recent, relatively recent report by the BBC, in fact, brings up the, the idea that uh, one-third of the population of England owes its lineage and ancestry to the Anglo-Saxons and the Germanic tribes of northern Germany and southern Scandinavia. So these groups had influence, and they did come, and they did come in numbers. Did they come as military federate signing agreements? And you, one has to think that must have some resemblance of truth, because if Gildas is wrong, then it makes little sense to bring the Saxon populations in. They're coming into Sivatas and other areas and they're taking them over. They're changing them culturally and, and in ways that are very different from what we're used to at this point. And the only functional reason that, that the Roman Britons would have done this is if they needed help. And there's evidence that they asked for help. Now, whether this evidence is fundamentally true is debatable. But there's enough circumstantial evidence and there's enough suggestion to say that there was still invasions going on in Britain that were causing the British people trouble. It would make perfect sense that a late antiquity population with very Roman ideas and ways of doing things would still hold to the old ways of doing things because most of them didn't go out of fashion or out of use and into the 6th century. It would make sense that that group would obviously hold to these ideas and hold to those opinions. So why wouldn't you get Federate to help you? If you yourself are not necessarily the greatest militarily, if you've taken defeat after defeat because you're dealing with an enemy which has more troops and more people or is better trained or has better weaponry, and you can bring in a group that's causing trouble to Roman 
population at the time to help you out, be they Frankish or whatever, that would make some semblance of sense. And this would be a well-worn Roman tradition. And if we're talking about a Romanized portion of Britain, and if there is one part of Britain that's Romanized, it is the, the lowland region of England. And so this, again, makes sense. The other thing is, is that we find from the archaeological record is not what the portrayal of the situation is presented. The presented idea is that the Anglo-Saxons came in, beat everyone, stole everything, became the power. But in fact, it looks as if the power was flipped around. The real power was held by the British. They had the money, they had the trade, they had the income, uh, they had the food supplies to be able to enforce their will upon the Saxons, at least for a short time. And probably for the first 10 or 15 years, that's the way it worked. The Romans held, the Roman British held the levers of power and controlled them. And it was the Saxons who were basically the ones under the thumb. And you can tell this because why would there be this uprising? Why would there be this extra demand for food that Gildas talks about? Why would there be uh, an event? You know, if things were working the way it was described in that they were brought in as federate, it was a small group of what amounts to a mercenary band brought in. The likelihood of them turning around and saying, oh, hey, look, these guys are weak. Let's go in. It's a possibility like the stories that Gildas talks about and, and Bede talks about of the, the Saxons going back to their own people and saying, hey, these guys are ripe for a takeover. There's a possibility that that could be true, but that didn't necessarily happen that way initially. And especially in this period, even the tribes that invade Gaul and invade Italy and invade all these other places, Hispania, they're not looking to become different from the Romans. They're looking to Romanize themselves after a fashion. And the Saxons may have seen the Roman lifestyle and wanted it, and especially if they're being held away from it. So, of course, they're going to start to bring family over. Of course, they're going to start to unite their communities and build things, especially if, as is suspected, that the Saxon communities in northern Germany are under pressure from invading forces coming out of the steppe regions. Because, of course, at this time we have the Huns, we have the Goths, we have all sorts of things going on with the Franks that are pushing, pushing, pushing on the Roman Empire in general, but specifically into even their own areas and areas around them. So German tribes are getting pushed by other tribes who are getting pushed. And all of this comes to bear initially on the idea that they want to come into the Roman Empire. And eventually, the desire to be Romanized, to have what the Romans have, overwhelms the Roman population's ability to confront them and deal with it. And so we have this total breakdown of society around these groups. And then we have what amounts to civil war. And this is what happens with the Anglo-Saxons. They come into this situation initially probably as mercenaries, possibly as settlers. They may have been coming in in family groups because you, you would do that in some senses. You would bring your family with you. And once you got here, especially that part of England is a very nice, very pastoral, easy to grow things. The weather is good. You don't deal with a lot of snow. The climate is generally pleasant. It just, it always becomes a target in part because it's attractive and it becomes attractive to the Vikings and eventually the Normans and eventually other people trying to invade Britain. The island has by its nature always been one that draws people to it. And so that is no, no different for the Saxons than it is for the British, for it was the Romans, where it was, you know, go back as far as we can go. Even in the Ice Age, we get people moving to Britain. So all of this points to a fact that the Saxon arrival is not one that is a surprise. It is not an invasion the way we would think of it. It is rather a need which needed to be filled. And Gildas calls it that. He doesn't call it an invasion. That's a later interpretation taken up by later scholars and later antiquarians that didn't exist in the original records. And 
comes out of actually later records, especially the, the, the medieval periods later on, where you have people leaping to conclusions and leaping to ideas, which don't necessarily exist. And so we have a, a people who are brought to the island who are more militaristic. So it does make some sense. There is some idea that this would be an attractive place for them to come to, and that they would start, at least at first, in good faith as there and we just there's so much guesswork here i don't really want to speculate too much but you can guess that somebody who's in a poorer position than somebody else who's has somebody else reigning over them it can create friction it can create problems and when you have the types of things going on as what seem to be going on at this period where there is one class that's very wealthy another class is very poor Combine it with some of the problems that are going on in the communities at this time as the Roman structures start to break down, it becomes easier to see why Saxon populations in the eastern part of Britain would start to look at their neighbors and say, well, we want what you have. And they would intermarry, they would intermingle, the kids would associate with one another, and slowly but surely, groups would combine together. And... We're going to talk a little bit more about what comes out of that, but at least for now, what we have is a settlement, not an invasion. Once we get past that, everything else is pretty easy to understand, but we need to understand that this is not some mass three-tribed invasion of Britain, which creates this new kingdom called England. It is actually a group of people brought over to do a specific job who then bring more family members over, which becomes settlement, not invasion, and then the friction starts to happen. Then the problems start to occur. Then you have the arrogance and the might of the Saxon military brought to bear against the British tribes that are now forming in in what used to be Roman Britain. So we're going to go further into this next week. We're going to talk a lot more about some of the Saxon settlements, about what becomes of this conflict and how does this shake out, at least as far as the records and to some extent how the archaeology has pointed it out. And then after that, we'll talk about everyone's favorite, <laughs> King Arthur. I'd like to remind everyone you can always contact me at the Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com if you have any questions, comments, things you want to tell me, criticize me. I don't really care. Uh, if you want to contact me on Twitter, you can reach me at uh, Welsh History Pod. And you can contact me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Welsh History Podcast. And if you want to find out other things that I do and other things that, uh, that Distractions Media does, you can check us out at distractionsmedia.com. I think it's well worth your time if you want to check that out. Anyway, until next time, everyone, take care. Have a good day. Bye. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more information, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com.